Hi, my name is Tegan Warwick. I am a cannabis pharmacist in Duluth, Minnesota. Yes, it is a requirement here in Minnesota and many other states that pharmacists are utilized for the dispensing process and educating patients. So we are fully licensed pharmacists, so you can always feel free to ask us questions about your other medications as well. Cannabis and marijuana are often used interchangeably, but they actually don't quite mean the same thing. Marijuana refers to parts or products of the plant that contain large amounts of THC, whereas cannabis refers to all parts or products of the plant, which also includes the CBD, another big component that we focus on at the dispensary. So really we feel cannabis is a bit more of an accurate term versus marijuana. Under federal law, cannabis is still listed as a Schedule I drug. Basically, this means that it is illegal in all circumstances. However, on a state-by-state -state level, cannabis is 100% legal for medical or even recreational uses in some cases. Minnesota is a medical cannabis state only, which means we can only sell to patients that are in the medical cannabis program. We do not sell any recreational cannabis. Some states do have both recreational and medical programs set up. However, that's not the case in our state. The medical side usually has different healthcare professionals working to help guide patients in choosing the best product and best doses for them. Whereas the recreational side, typically people are on their own to choose what they feel is best for them. What this boils down to for patients here in Minnesota, making sure to keep your cannabis here in the state. If you take it outside of the state, even to another one that has legalized cannabis to one form or another, you could still get into trouble for taking it over state boundaries. If you are traveling with your cannabis here in the state, make sure to bring either a prescription label attached right to the medication or the duplicate label on your medication guide just in case you get pulled over by law enforcement just to prove that you are a medical patient. Although it is still federally illegal, Minnesota and many other states have set up protections for both the healthcare workers and the patients in the cannabis program, so there won't be any penalties against them. The federal government has also made statements indicating they will not pursue any federal charges against healthcare workers or patients dispensing or using cannabis within the state's guidelines. I don't worry about the Board of Pharmacy coming after my license and certifying providers don't have to worry about that either. Legal considerations do also impact the cost of medications and help patients are able to pay for it though. Health insurance companies will not pay for medical cannabis at all due to its federal classification. Everything does need to be purchased out of pocket, which can get expensive for some people. We cannot accept credit card payments for the same reason. Payment must be with either cash or debit card. A patient looking to get enrolled in the medical cannabis program needs to meet two criteria. First, they must have one of the state's qualifying medical conditions, and two, they must be approved by a certifying provider. There are many qualifying conditions here in the state, such as chronic or intractable pain, obstructive sleep apnea, PTSD, autism, seizure disorders, and cancer, among others. A full list of these qualifying conditions can be found on the Department of Health's website. This list is evolving and being updated based on new research and advocacy efforts for new conditions to be added to that list. For example, anxiety is one of the conditions being evaluated to be incorporated into the medical cannabis program here in the near future in Minnesota. A certifying provider must evaluate the patient and determine if they do indeed meet one of the qualifying conditions. And then after being approved by the certifying provider, the patient would pay the state a registration fee to be set up into the Department of Health program. And then at that point, they are set to meet with one of the pharmacists at any of the cannabis patient centers throughout the state to come up with a care plan and discuss how to use the medical cannabis appropriately. And after that initial consultation, the first dispensing of cannabis can occur. Patients that are enrolled in the medical cannabis program are able to purchase cannabis from any of the cannabis patient centers. There are currently 13 cannabis patient centers split between two companies spread throughout different parts of Minnesota. Each of the two companies carries their own specific line of products approved by the state and requires a consultation with the pharmacist before purchasing any products. 
approved patients are allowed to visit both companies. Cannabis is still federally illegal, and the protections of one state does not necessarily extend to that of other states. Crossing state lines is illegal with cannabis, even if traveling from one state to another where cannabis is legal in both states. Therefore, we do recommend just keeping the cannabis here in Minnesota. As long as you're in the state, you are going to be protected under state laws. Now, if you do travel to a state where medical cannabis is legalized, the other state may recognize your medical cannabis registration here in Minnesota and allow you to purchase cannabis in that state. This does all vary from state to state, so you'd have to check with their local laws and regulations. But for sure, all cannabis purchased in another state could not be brought back here to Minnesota. The state does approve all the dosage forms and routes of administrations that we're allowed to offer to patients. None of these medications are FDA approved since cannabis is not federally legal. Currently, we do have vaping, tablets, topicals, some different liquids, and a few special forms, but the state's always approving new options. So if you're not happy with the current selection of what we have to offer, other routes will likely be in place down the road. At this point, we do not sell the actual flower or bud itself, Hopefully this is incorporated into the program sometime soon as many patients can benefit from the full plant and certainly this would help with the cost as well. Currently, the state of Minnesota does not allow us to differentiate between sativa and indica, basically the two main strains of cannabis. Sativa is typically a more uplifting and energizing strain, whereas indica is more of a sedating and relaxing strain. The grow house team where we manufacture everything here in Minnesota, they do grow a hybrid plant, sativa and indica together, and pull the THC and CBD out of those plants. So at this point, we do not differentiate between the two strains. I'm hoping in the near future we'll be able to, because I certainly think there's going to be benefits to maybe using sativa during the daytime, indica in the evening. Hopefully it's to come, but we'll see. Each of us has an internal endocannabinoid system consisting of different cellular receptors that detect the THC and CBD in the body. Our bodies also create their own compounds similar to THC and CBD called endocannabinoids. Now, all of these products, the endocannabinoids, the THC and the CBD, act on these special receptors in your endocannabinoid system. And when these receptors are activated, that leads to the beneficial effects of the cannabis, such as stopping the pain signal from getting sent to our brains. THC and CBD are the two most widely known cannabinoids. There are two main cannabinoid receptors in the body, cannabinoid receptor 1 and cannabinoid receptor 2. Now, THC acts as an activator of cannabinoid receptor 1, where it exerts much of its effects, such as the head high. THC can help with appetite stimulation, controlling nausea and vomiting, different types of pain, sleep, and controlling night terrors. CBD actually doesn't appear to activate these cannabinoid receptors like THC does. Instead, it actually works to reduce the amount that THC activates the receptors, so it'll somewhat diminish the head high and some of the negative aspects of THC. CBD functions in other spots throughout the body like pain and serotonin receptors. Overall, CBD is an anti-inflammatory agent, an anxiolytic, an anticonvulsant, and a painkiller. Terpenes are a broad class of naturally occurring compounds that are found in a lot of different plants, including cannabis. There are thousands of different terpenes owned in nature. Mostly they're used by plants to help attract pollinators or to ward off pests. When patients use the terpenes along with their THC and CBD, it can promote better health outcomes. The major role of terpenes is their anti-inflammatory effects, but there's also evidence to suggest they play a role in being an anxiolytic, helping with anxiety, being an antioxidant, as well as being anti-tumor. For us, we do have a few different distillate vapes that have terpenes included in them. And each of those vapes has a slightly different terpene profile, so each is going to taste and smell slightly differently based on the terpene profile in each vape.
Cannabis isn't without its share of side effects. In terms of CBD, the major side effects are upset stomach, fatigue, diarrhea, sometimes lost appetite. At consistently higher doses, there is a potential for liver damage, and it's important that certain patients get their liver function monitored periodically. THC, on the other hand, is the component that causes the head high or euphoria. Patients may feel like their head's in a cloud or have haziness or a fuzziness feeling in the head. Certainly, THC can increase appetite. If you've ever heard of the munchies, it's certainly a real thing. It can increase sedation or tiredness, as well as increase heart rate. At high enough doses of THC, we can sometimes see paranoia or increased anxiety. And it's certainly important with cannabis to start the dose nice and low and increase it slowly over time. Typically, patients are going to need both THC and CBD together to different amounts, and this is very patient-specific. We do work to ensure that patients start on a low dose of the THC and build up the dose slowly over time to lessen the chance of any uncomfortable head high. Some patients are just going to benefit with CBD on its own or with a small amount of THC. So in these cases, patients really aren't going to get that head high, or if they are, to a very, very low extent. So there is a difference between tolerance and dependence. Certainly with the cannabis, patients might build up a tolerance over time, basically meaning they're going to need slightly higher doses to get the same effect as their body adjusts to the cannabis. Usually what I find is patients might need to build their dose up slowly over the first couple to a few months, but then they plateau and are able to stay at the same dose for quite a long period of time. Cannabis does have somewhat of a dependence or addictive potential to it, but it's far less than that of, say, opioids or benzodiazepines, other addictive medications medications that are out there. There are some medications that can interact with cannabis in a negative way. For starters, if you do take a blood thinner such as warfarin, you'd want to make sure to get your INR checked a bit more frequently when you're first starting off with the cannabis. Certainly also let your pharmacist and your certifying provider know if you're using the cannabis and the warfarin together. Other medications, some pain medications like oxycodone, some anxiety medications like Ativan or Xanax, sleep medications like Ambien or Trazodone, all of these medications can increase the euphoric effects and the sedative effects of cannabis, and they should be used with caution when used in combination. You certainly can use them together, but sometimes patients have the goals of reducing the opioids or their anxiety medications or their sleep medications and instead replacing it with the cannabis. Your cannabis pharmacist will always discuss any medication concerns that they note on your initial consultation. And certainly be open with your pharmacist if any of your medications change. You can discuss any potential issues with your pharmacist at your cannabis patient center. There are certain people where medical cannabis isn't necessarily an appropriate option for them. For example, women who are nursing or pregnant should not use any medical cannabis, as well as those with a history or family history of schizophrenia or those with underlying heart arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation. These conditions can interact with the cannabis in a negative way. We always like to touch base with a cardiologist or a psychiatrist first before we ever dispense cannabis to patients with these conditions. As a cannabis pharmacist, I consider a few factors when making a therapeutic recommendation. A few common considerations are the CBD to THC ratio we'll want to use for the condition, the route of administration that's acceptable to the patient, and the dose of the cannabis, especially with cannabis naive patients or patients that are new to cannabis versus those that are experienced with it. First, each qualifying condition is going to need a different ratio of THC to CBD, basically the two main active components of the cannabis plant that we focus on. At the company that I work for, we use a color scheme to represent the ratios of THC to CBD. Our warm colors, red and yellow, are very THC dominant. Green is a one-to-one -one THC to CBD ratio, or equal amounts of both. And the cool colors, blue, indigo, and violet, are CBD dominant. Now the THC can cause the head high, euphoria, sedation, fatigue, all that goes along with THC. 
and the CBD it can cause increase in nausea and an upset stomach. For example, for the different conditions, pain, depending on the type of pain, is oftentimes going to be best controlled with an even ratio of THC to CBD, or it tends towards the more THC dominant side. For seizures and autism, we're going to be using the CBD dominant products. And for PTSD, the patient may require an equal combination during the daytime for anxiety, and then a larger THC dose in the evening to help with sleep and any night terrors. Therapy is selected based on side effect profiles as well. THC can very much make patients tired, which can be beneficial in the evening, as well as increasing appetite for those patients with, say, cancer and cachexia or wasting. So a THC dominant product would be appropriate in these cases. We also consider, like I had mentioned, the route of administration or the dosage form. If a patient maybe has localized pain, we might want to focus on using a topical. Or if they have a lung condition, asthma, COPD, we may want to stay away from the vapes. Also for patients that are new to cannabis, we're going to want to make sure to start low and work our way up on the dose nice and slowly. This can help ease any negative side effects of the cannabis, as well as not give too much of that head high right in the beginning. When patients are experienced with cannabis, they may require a bit higher dose initially due to their built up tolerance. Also for patients with seizure disorders or autism, we're gonna be using their weight to calculate an appropriate dose for them. Your pharmacist will utilize all this information to help choose the best products for you. Because payments are paid out of pocket and no health insurance company pays for it, the pharmacist does work to select a cost-effective option for each patient. This ensures patients are able to get the therapy that they need at an affordable price. Always let your pharmacist or certifying provider know if you have any questions or concerns regarding your medical cannabis or if you have any medication changes. We are here to partner with you and help you achieve your best health outcomes. If you are indeed a proponent of cannabis and want to help break the stigma, be an advocate with your state and local legislators and your primary care physician. Together, we can raise awareness and break barriers to improve access to medical cannabis so that everyone who might benefit can pursue this treatment option. Also, feel free to leave a comment down below if you have any general questions on medical cannabis, I'm happy to answer.